All right, I want to welcome on my next guest. We've got former UCF standout and longtime NFL defensive end, Lijay Deuceable. Lijay, how's everything going for you? It's going good, Zach, man. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Appreciate you taking the time. So I've got, I've got a quick question for you that I just thought of literally two minutes ago, and I'm not sure if you get it all the time or you've never gotten it before. What was it like playing in the East-West Bowl? Uh, well, actually, I played in the um, Texas versus the nation. No, I, I, I mean with Key and Peele. Oh, <laughs> that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, it was cool, man. Um, <laughs> I remember it was my first year in New York and we did it and the Super Bowl happened to be that year. And when they asked me to do it, I was like, hell yeah. You know, Ken Pell was one of my favorite shows uh, back then. So it was a no brainer for me. What, what was that whole situation like? Did you, do, you, do you get to ask that all the time or no? I, uh, the funny thing is I got asked it a lot, like right after the episode aired and probably like uh, a couple years after, cause they would repeat, you know, show yeah. every year around full time. Um, but uh, like the last like four or five years, not really, I haven't really been asked that question a lot, but uh, it was, it was an amazing experience. I mean, me and a few guys with unique names yeah. and of course, A.A. Ron, you know, Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> um, so to, to be in that, that category with those group of guys was, was amazing. What, which of their made up names do you think is the best? FUD. <laughs> I was listening to it. What did they say? Uh, Strunk Flug It? I'm like, I'm like, yeah, uh, that name I couldn't even try to pronounce if I wanted to. So I wasn't even going to go with that one. But I think Fudge just was, was a good name. It was just the way he said it. it was like, FUD. That was, that was, do you, do you think they stole uh, Chappelle's show? You know, it's crazy. People, <laughs> and even Dave Chappelle actually commented on this in one of his um, comments. <laughs> series and when he did a stand-up he was like i had to watch key and peel literally steal my damn show <laughs> while i was away and um i say that they were probably inspired by it i'm not saying they stole the show sure. but i think there was definitely a need for that once Chappelle left and i think they kind of picked that up and, and took it and ran with it yeah i think stump tv and robo click doesn't get the shine he deserves yeah so. yeah <laughs> so yeah so how's everything going it's a wild world we're living in pandemic hopefully we're getting this under control but what, what has everything been for you it's been good it's like you said it's just been uh the new normal right yeah. like trying to adjust to the new normal and um you know I've, I've been blessed i've been able to you know still do you know all my media media stuff calling the ucf games oh, and, cool. and uh you know i was on track to, to probably work for fox or, or espn but you know with with what's going on i've had to let so many people go so I also was able to start my, my, my training company, which was another blessing. Oh, in cool. and, you know, I trained a lot of pro guys, trained some high school guys, some college guys. So it's, that's been going really well. And then I have my podcast and then I also have my cooking thing. So, you know, I really was able to dive in a few of my passions because of this time off. Usually I would have been traveling back and forth, you know, the UCF, which I'm still doing, but also I'd have been traveling a lot to New York and LA to, to work with NFL Network and then work with s and yeah. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, because of what's going on, everything's yeah. been virtual. So I've been, you know, like sitting right here in front of this laptop, like everybody else. <laughs> so I want to ask you, so about your cooking show, what's the most out there thing you can cook, that you cook well? Hmm, out there thing. I mean, it depends what, what is what is out there for Like, you. I don't know if you've seen Serge Ibaka's show and he, uh, he and so, yeah. So people ask me and compare our stuff all the time. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not eating snake, snake. I'm not doing any of that. Like, no, I don't. I'm, I'm a pescatarian, so I mean, you won't get any really, you won't get any chicken or none of that on my show. But I treat, I eat a, a whole bunch of different seafood, so you oh, know, cool. you'll see, you'll see scallops, you'll see, you know, all different types of fish, flounders, sea bass, um, haddock. Um, uh, I'm not a big salmon guy, I'm mainly like. I'm not water. a salmon. I don't like. I think salmon. Salmon's very overrated, in my opinion. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, and, and health value, it's overrated. So yeah. like, I eat a lot of grouper. So stuff like that, uh, you'll see on my show. Uh, I'm going to start trying to get into more oysters and stuff. Oh, cool. that, that might be as exotic as I get. And the thing is, I always try to cook my stuff with a little flair and, and a little different twist. So oh, I don't cool. try to get, you know, traditionally. I always try to, yeah. to put my own pizzazz on it. Yeah, because when they when they bring out like Fred Van Vliet and Siakam and they open up, they get the cover on the plate and they're, and they're like, you can tell their heart is pumping yeah, and exactly. they rip, rip it off. And Pascal Siakam's like, nah, I'm like, I'm not eating that. So... <laughs> That boy Baca, man, he eats some nah, weird stuff. Yeah, no, nah, it's it, I, mean, I travel a lot, so I used to kind of be like that. Um, I really don't like how we produce meat in the United States, is one of the main reasons why I stopped eating meat. But in other countries where it's more natural, I could, you know, see me potentially maybe, 
you know, you know, trying to tidbit here and there yeah. of, of different types of food. And yeah. I always want to embrace the culture when I travel somewhere. So if it's something that's, you know, a delicacy for them, I, I wouldn't mind yeah. trying. What did I say? Yeah. Try anything once and the good things twice. That's fair. No, yeah. Because remember, he was making those smoothies and they were like, what's your secret? He goes, crickets. And they go, crickets. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's maybe, maybe that's why Kawhi left um maybe <laughs> he was he was pushing that stuff on him he said they don't have that in LA I'm not dealing with that stuff so what I want to ask you a little about your football career so how, how did you how did you end up at UCF so um coming out of high school uh you know I had a few offers and I, I know I wanted to be in Florida honestly I wanted to go to Florida State and they didn't recruit me how I wanted them to like I wasn't like a, one of their main guys and you could feel it you know during the recruiting process who really wants you yeah. And so I decided um, I didn't want to go to USF. They recruited me. I wanted to be away from home. And everybody I knew from home was going to USF. So I was like, well, I've been competing with, against these guys my whole life. I might as well compete against them in college. So, you know, UCF was on the table. Uh, Virginia Tech was a team I thought about highly because of the educational value. I wanted to be in here coming out of high school. And Virginia Tech was a good school for that. Yeah. But then, you know, Blacksburg so far away. <laughs> so, There's not much around. I'm, yeah, I'm, in, yeah. I'm in DC. This yeah. is such a different world. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I actually took an unofficial visit to Blacksburg, like my sophomore and junior year. And I was like, it's cool up here. It's just so far away, man. It gets cold. Like, like you, you go fo- too far out. There's no Wi Fi. Like you, you better know where you're going. That's the kind exactly. of Exactly. So that kind of, you know, d- deterred me from going there. I even thought about Georgia Tech. Oh. Uh, but they ended up taking another kid out of Tampa, uh, Jesuit, instead of me. So when I went to take my visit to UCF, it just felt like home. I mean, they really sold it. This was, I was part of O'Leary's first recruiting class. Oh, cool. And then um, he talked about how we we're going to have our own stadium one day. And we're going to be like the only team in Florida with an indoor and for the longest we were. And just everything he talked about, like they delivered on. So, um, you know, at the time, you don't know if it's going to be true or not, but it sounded amazing to me. And I knew I was going to be able to play as a true freshman. So, I mean, that, all those things really sold me on UCF. Was Danny White there when you got there? No, no, we didn't have him. We had uh, Keith, um, what was Keith's name? I forgot Keith's last name, but yeah. it was enough for the great. Yeah. yeah, interesting. That's why. Do, do you have a UCF National Champions banner somewhere in your in your place? Uh, well, I don't know if you see, you see my helmet right here. <laughs> National Champs, because they, 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 they didn't get the credit they deserve. So yeah, I mean, well, if you're in the state of good state of Florida, <laughs> you know, it's recognized as yeah. you know, them being national champs. So we're going to take that. Which of former some of the former UCF guys that are in the league now are you are you did you expect to see have great careers? Um, while I was playing, or the guys that are there now, like uh, that are in there now, like watching on Sundays, you're like, oh yeah, I saw that coming. Well, I, I, I knew Sha- Shaquille Griffin was oh, going cool. to really go at a high level of the corner. Um, it just sucked for him that he didn't get to really partake in the, 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 the true success that UCF is at now. And I mean, he had a few conference championships while he was there. But um, his, his, his last year was his first year with, with Scott Frost. And, you know, the next year is when they ended up going undefeated. So his brother really got to, you know, really partake in all of that. And he only got one year of, you know, I want to say mediocre because it was a, it was a we were laying the forefront of what 2017, 18 would be, you know, and 19 of winning, you know, double digit wins uh, three consecutive years in a row. But uh, I knew he was going to be a good player just because of his hype. Uh, this physicality at the line of scrimmage and his speed. I mean, he's a blazer. A kid runs a four three. I knew he was going to be a problem. Uh, one player that I'm looking to take to take the next step is Trey Quan Smith. I thought he was going to be a. He's, a, had, flashes. You know, he's had flashes. He's had flashes, and I'm looking for him to be like that number two behind Mike Thomas. And you know, they, they went and got um, um, Sanders. They got Sanders. Uh, they went and got Emmanuel Sanders this year. And, uh, you know, and he's had a couple games where, it's, where he's like really flash and then yeah. there's other games where he's not there. Yeah. Another kid I thought was going to be really good. It came out the same year as Trey Quan was uh, Aiken, the, the tight end. And he was playing really uh, well. Houston? He got out of Houston. Before he got hurt, he, I felt like he was playing really well. And, um, you know, not contract year this year, next year's contract year, but, you know, your third year kind of sets you up for your contract year. So, I mean, it sucked to see him go down because I felt like he was starting to really – find his footing in that offense with Deshaun Watson. So, I mean, these these are a few players that I thought, you know, we're going to play. And I think Mike Hughes has had some up, ups and downs. And the thing that sucked about him, he was kind of hurt, you know, banged up yeah. coming in with an injury. He got hurt towards ACL his rookie year. 
And I think that's that's hurt, like stunted his growth a little bit. But um, I feel like, especially that last drive versus Seattle, when when they put him on Metcalf, he really you know showed up and shut him down. And then Metcalf scored the touchdown, but he it wasn't on Mike Hughes. Hey, that's that's like, all that counts. That's all that matters. Yeah, you know, Mike. I felt like Mike played well. I mean, but that defense has just kind of been maligned this whole year. It's not really a Mike Zimmer defense that you've seen in the past. So I mean, those are those are a few of the guys that I looked at and. You know, uh, people talk about Blake Bortles. I think he got a bad rep in Jacksonville because the man had, what, four different coordinators? A quarter, a quarter away from the Super Bowl, and it's, somehow he's on a practice squad. I don't quarter understand. Away, and I still think he holds the record for c- completion percentage in the playoff game versus Pittsburgh. That's so crazy. People talk crazy to him, but yeah, I think Jalen Ramsey and a few of the players said it the best. I mean, I, they felt like the coaching staff got scared and they didn't want to put that, the game in his hands, and they should have because he was playing at a high level that game already. So, I mean, those are those are a few of the guys. And I think this year coming out, you know, I think Richie Grant will be another one that has a long career. Aaron Robinson, to me, is going to be the highest um, drafted player out of the American Conference at, at nickel, which is crazy. Who would have thought in a few years ago that nickel corners would probably go second, third round? But he's a guy that, that most likely will go second and third round because if you look at your nickel guy, he's got to be able to play the Sam in the box when it's run. He's got to be able to cover um, the quick, shifty receivers. And you got to think most of the NFL – it's three wide for like 75% of their plays. Yeah. So a nickel corner is practically a starter on your team. So teams are, you know, we have really elevated that position and treated, treated it as a starting role on your team. Yeah. So, so for your experience there, what was, what was that like? Was there an adjustment period for you? Or was it was relatively easy to get going from when, high when you, college, from high school to UCF for you. Oh, there's a huge, I mean, there's a huge adjustment from high school to college, college to the NFL. And they talk about the speed of the game. Yes, the, the speed, you know, ramps up a lot. But I think the biggest thing from high school to college is just like you're literally playing in high school and you're a kid, right? But yeah. we, once you get to college, you might not know it. You're a grown man, man. And you're playing against 21, 22-year-olds, sometimes 23-year-old grown men out there. And I think there's an adjustment period because the, the, the strength of players, right, the speed of players and – you know, everybody was that guy at their high school. Just like in college, when you go from college to the, the NFL, everybody yeah. was there. We got to think everybody in the NFL was their guy on their college team, too. So there's definitely an adjustment period. Just, I would just say the terminology, like high school, everything simplistic. Uh, learning different defensive schemes and even on offense, the terminology of plays, that's a big difference from high school to college. I mean, there might have been a, a, a number on a wristband and you knew this was uh, zone right and this was yeah. zone left. Well, no, there's a long play in high school and college that you have to learn. And then on offense, you you know, each thing is broken down to what the O-line does, what the receiver does, what the back does. And once your part is, you know, the quarterback tells you your part, you kind of, uh, I've talked to a few offensive players, they say kind of tune out the rest of the play <laughs> because they know exactly what they have to do. But on defense, you got to, you have to know the different terminologies and then you got to know the adjustments off that when if something changes mid-play. So those are the biggest differences. Were you, I, I'm sure... Every kid wants to be in the NFL. Yeah. When did somebody else bring up to you and say, hey, you got a shot? I don't think anybody came to me and said, I told myself I was going to get to the NFL. And uh, as I told you before, I wanted to be an engineer coming into yeah. to, you know, college originally. But I also, I think around like eighth, ninth grade, I, I started telling my parents, you know, I'm going to play in the NFL. And, you know, most parents don't want to technically hear that because they want <laughs> you to have, a, you know, a set plan that yeah. more realistic, you know, quote unquote realistic. Yeah. But um, my dad has always had a, a saying for me that says, uh, how bad do you want it? And what are you willing to do to achieve? And that's always stuck with me. And it's something that to this day, I tap, I tape on the back of my, you know, master bedroom door and, and look at it before I walk out every single day. And that's how I just view life. I mean, if I want some bad enough what am I willing to do to get it what am I willing to sacrifice to get it and I knew nobody was going to outwork me you know I went I went the hard way right I drafted free agent made it 10 years in the NFL um I, I believe in my position there was only two guys that outlasted me uh who Chris, Chris Long and I know their names Chris Long and well, his Hayes. dad played that's why he outlasted you so yeah <laughs> three years it was, it was three players Chris Long William Hayes and then Calais is the last one he's still playing right now uh, Calais Campbell was the last lineman in our class still playing in the uh, wow. 08 class. Wow, that's wild. I think he just got named a uh, defensive player of the week. He did. I think hey, he oh, three, hey. sacks versus, three sacks versus Philly. He went, hey. it went off. <laughs> that's wild. So I have a question. So going into your senior year, what, what did they say? Did they say, hey, like you have a shot at getting drafted? Or did you say you're going to you're gonna have to work harder than the next guy? 
Well, no, nah, but going, uh, you say going into senior year or after senior In, year? Into senior year. Well, and going into senior year, I was already on the, the watch list for East West uh, for senior bowl and a few other things. I, I just was just off conference the year before in our conference. So uh, they didn't really, I don't remember looking up projections because I was, I was kind of like locked in to the season and uh, I was going to make everybody believe. But I know as the season was going on, a lot of teams had me projected to go in third through fifth round. And, um, you know, that didn't happen, you know, and I wasn't going to cry or spill milk. And there was guys that were, you know, I don't talk about, like to talk about a lot of players games, but there was guys that were getting called to get drafted from colleges I had never even <laughs> heard of. And I was like, what in the world? But I was like, you know what? Everything happens for a reason. You know, God put me in this position. I'm going to just outwork everybody. And 10 years later, like I said, there was only only three guys. And, and two of those guys, uh, one of those guys won the second round, Calais, who should have won the first. And another one won the top three picks. So, um, not bad. <laughs> I'm not shabby if, if you look at it that way, right? <laughs> yeah. So, 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 like, so, so draft night, did you, did you know, did, did you sit through the whole thing or did you like, uh, you know, I, I you sat do? through the whole thing and it was different, right? Because like, now it's three nights, but when I came out, it was just two. It was first, second round. Then it was the, or it was actually it was first through third, maybe. Okay. First through third and then four, yeah, four through seven. So it was long days. Like that was the longest Saturday and Sunday night of my life still to this day. Sitting through every pick. And I, I mean, I, in my head, I was like, I might have a chance to get in the third. So I'm going to watch, you know, and that didn't come. And then I'm sitting through fourth round, fifth round. Six round teams start calling me and they're like, if you go on draft, then you know when we come in. I'm like, undrafted? Like, what are you talking about? Like, it's the sixth round. Like, you can still draft me. Like, you have a pick. <laughs> like, what, what's going on? Which, which lets you know, like, when the sixth and seventh round comes, a lot of those teams are, are treating those like undrafted picks, technically, because they've kind of already picked who they want to want to bring in. And it's usually like the, if a coach like wants a pick and he has like a like a, a favorite guy or position that he wants to target, then they, they'll let the coach, because most of the time the GM is picking, you know, most of the picks first through like fifth round, but sixth, seventh round, like, you know, sometimes they'll give a little leeway to the coach. Like yeah. if you, if you have a, you know, a flirt that's on this list, you can go ahead and pick them up here, you know, um, which like I said, it's crazy to me. Cause I mean, it's some, I think it's something special to be drafted. I, I wouldn't know, but to have your name called to be one of the, what is it? 247 or yeah. whatever it is picks to be called like that's that's something to really you know lay your you know put your hat on and yeah. something you can tell your kids and grandkids and uh for them to be like yeah if you don't get picked here and i'm and like like i said this was in the sixth round this wasn't even the seventh round so like it was just baffling to me you learn so much about this game as you go through it and you know there's things that you don't know going into it that you later learn that you learn fast because you realize and and, and i tell this with even high school kids now going into college, you have to treat this like a business. Like yeah. picking your school is not about like the, the best, whoever has the best uniforms or who has Nike, who has, you know, Under Armour, Adidas. No, it's, it's, this is the business. If you have aspirations of going to the next, it's a business decision. You can treat it as such when you're on your visits, you, you tell them what you want, yeah. you know, demand what you want because, you know, they're trying to get your services. Because once they get you in the building, all oh, that goes out the window. Like they own you now. <laughs> like, and that's how they really treat it. So it's like, you have to treat this like a business. I have a question. Why do you think it is that undrafted guys last so much longer than seventh rounders? Hunger, 100%. It's hunger. It's because um, if you look at it, like a lot of us are pissed off because we felt like we should have got drafted. And the projections showed that we should have got drafted and we didn't get drafted. So we're not going to let anybody outwork us at that point of, you know, when it comes to that point. We're pissed off because we're like, I know I'm better than, and not to talk about anybody's game. Like I said, I don't like anybody's game, but it's like, I know I'm better than that guy. Yeah. And he got drafted, what, fourth, fifth round? I'm going to outwork him. And that, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to stick because yeah. as I've learned through throughout the NFL, if a guy gets drafted, he's going to be on the team at least once, one or two years. And that's that's seven rounders included. GMs love their draft picks and they, you know, they hold to on to them too long sometimes. And it's because they don't want to be made as, or made as, they don't want to be looked as, as they've made a bad decision, right? So it's like, those those draft picks are their kids. They're like yeah. guys that, that probably shouldn't have been on the team for, for yeah. three or four years. They'll let, they'll let them, they'll keep giving them chances until they really, you know, hang themselves. So it's like, just because you outwork somebody or you play better, it doesn't mean you're necessarily made the team, but I learned this. There's 32 other, I mean, 31 other teams that's looking at this film. And and that's why I kind of felt bad, especially this year as an undrafted free agent. Yeah. 
you know, guys, as far as them getting opportunities. Now, the good thing is the NFL did extend the practice squad. Yeah. So, so guys will be able to stick around maybe in the next year if they don't make the, you know, their team. They'll actually have preseason games where they'll be able to make other teams. But that's the one thing I really felt for 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 free agents. Like, cause I don't even know if I would have, you know, made the team my rookie year if, if I didn't have preseason. I most likely wouldn't have made the team if I didn't have preseason because teams were actually able to see what I did. And for 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 the, when I was with the Giants, they didn't want me to get posted, so they had to put me on active roster because uh, they had to kept me on practice squad. Teams would have been able to came and come and get me. So I really felt I felt I felt for you know low low draft picks, six seven round draft picks, and also undrafted free agents. Because there was, I think, up to 16 people on practice squad now. So they can literally yeah. hide somebody on practice squad. And you really don't know what they can do. Yeah, I don't think, what's his name? Josh McCown's on, was he on one of those practice squads? He hasn't shown up yet. He's just showing it. <laughs> nah, I, I would have loved to got that practice squad there. I can you definitely be a football analyst for you, a defensive yeah. analyst for you. And I'll be ready if you need me. Just give yeah. me like two weeks to get back right. Yeah. And then I can go. <laughs> I, I want to know who made the decision to pull the trigger on Roberto Aguayo in the second round a couple of years ago? Cause that one was like, we, we found the best wow. kicker of all time. And I don't know Tampa what he's doing. Day, wasn't it? Tampa. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like nothing he, against Aguayo. Really, nothing really, against Aguayo. He really, thought, he really thought he was one of those kickers that could change the game because at Florida state, he was, he was kind of like that right. guy. Yeah. It was great. But I still, for as far as needs of what Tampa needed, like you can't take a chicken that high. Like I think he would have probably been there in the fourth round. Like they could have took him. And like even in the fourth round, like there's value there. Like there's a lot of those guys in the fourth round are projected second round picks. Yeah. So it's like even then I'm like, uh, do you take a specialist? I, I, to me, the the highest I would ever take one. He would have to be like how Guerrero was one of the top guys ever in history, not just that year. Uh, would probably be the fifth round. That's where I would see a specialist of his caliber at the time going. Like, I don't even know if he's playing football anymore, is he? I have no, I have no idea. I, I think he's mentally killing him. And I remember he had a younger brother that was like, Yeah, they kid. said, Oh, he's better. I'm like, All right. So yeah. we'll see. I don't know. I don't think he panned out either, huh? I don't know. Maybe they're keeping their eyes on him. Brady's like, hey, I got a guy in waiting. Just don't worry. He's been, <laughs> he's been practicing. He's at the high school where I was running b- b- during COVID when they were telling me not to. He was practicing with me. Um, now, it, it's it's wild. It's interesting. It's, and I have a question. So if you were playing this year, would yeah. you have any hesitation about playing college football? College or? College. Or college. It would just depend on what my status was. Uh, First and foremost, like if I was a guaranteed first round pick, then I don't know if I would have played this year. Um, But if if it was, uh, you know, on the borderline of me going first or second round, then I most likely would have played. Because honestly, um, just, you know, talking to the UCF coaches and seeing that we've actually been one of the better teams as far as like uh, keeping keeping it level as far as cases, um, like they, they, like some of the college teams have been better than, you know, opting out because they, they really technically build a bubble around, yeah. you know, what the, the student athlete is doing there. And like literally, you know, straight from practice facility to the home and yeah, you can go get food, but you know, there's no, there's curfew and, and everything like that. So to me, I would have, you know, I would have wanted to know what the plan and play was yeah. first and foremost, especially if I had aspirations of going to the NFL, because we actually had a corner opt out that's going to probably go to the senior bowl and take okay. out um you know it kind of hurt our secondary but it's i mean it, he made the decision he has a little daughter too so you okay. know yeah, that's understandable. understandable um and, but we had two other guys that, that, that i mentioned aaron robinson who's probably going to go pretty high and then richie grant both of those guys could opt it out and they decided to come back and play and um you know they both played well this year and, and there hasn't been any issues with them knock on wood as far as like the yeah. covid covid cases so I would have to sit down with my family and first and foremost, I would, you know, ask, sit down with the head coach and be like, you know, you know, I really want to play this year. I need to know what the game plan is, you know, from, you know, from the beginning to the end, like, and I want, I want every stone turned over. I want to know if this happens, what we're going to do, what's the reaction to it? Because, you know, I have a, I have a little girl, you know, I, I don't want to put her at risk. And then also like, I think he would have had to make a decision to probably not see his daughter for what, four or five months yeah. just to be on the safe side. So I think at the end of the day, he made a decision, you know, was which was better for him and his family, and to sit out and just train, you know, you know, and get ready for for the Senior Bowl, and also get ready for the combine and, and everything else. Which we saw a lot of people, players do. You saw Marshall from, um, yeah, 
uh, LSU do it. You've seen uh, Gainwell from Memphis do it. A, Kid a from of, LSU, Chase, I think he's out. Yeah, yeah, Chase, not Marshall. Yeah, Chase, Chase decided to to, to leave and, and opt out. And you know the tackle from uh, Oregon. Uh, I don't think uh, oh, Sewell. He's a, he, he looks great. He's gonna be. Great. Yeah, exactly. You know the Pac-12 is gonna, I guess, eventually play. We'll see. <laughs> and I think uh, was it this week in the Big Ten? I you think know, so. The, yeah. Back this weekend, so. A few players in the Big Ten opted out. I know one the kid from Minnesota decided to opt back in. Bateman, and, right? The receiver? Yeah. He decided That's to opt back in and play. So so we'll see. I mean, some colleges have been better than others. And it's just hard to keep 18. We're, we're looking at you, Florida. Looking yeah. at you. Oh, I, Everybody and the coach. I had a tweet. Dan Mullen was complaining after the loss to Texas A&M and had the nerve to say that he wants to sell out crowd. And then, I'll, lo and behold, clown emoji, clown emoji, this guy's team is the reason why they don't play LSU. And it looks like they might not be playing for a while. So, I mean, for you to say something as ignorant as that, when we when we know what's going on in the nation, right? Yeah. This is a, this is a health risk. It has nothing to do about you being mad because, you know, Texas has probably bent the rules. The state of great, Texas, great state of Texas has bent the rules more than any other state as far as letting fans in and letting people into restaurants and everything else. Just because you see somebody else doing wrong doesn't mean you should also want to do wrong. It's more. It's more than just about the game of football, and, yeah. and Coach Mullen, I think, under understands that the hard way this week more than any. I got, a, I got. I got a hot take for you that I just thought of the other day. I've been noticing it in a lot of NFL games, and I don't know if it's true. I think it might be. You know how? I think the other day, nine of the fourteen games had fans. Mm. Okay, I think anytime they do a crowd shot of the fans, the cameraman says, you guys got five seconds to put your mask on. We're about to be on national TV. And then <laughs> the guys who don't listen, don't put it on. But other than that, no one wears masks the entire time. I can see that. I mean, you know, because sitting through a game three and a half hours with your mask on probably isn't yeah. the most comfortable listening ever. You're trying to get a pretzel in there? No, that's not happening. Come on. Yeah, I honestly think that they actually have people walking through the stadium. I hope so. Mask. Mass mass patrol is what you probably call them, right? right. And uh, that's because they do pan to the crowd every so often. That's so. Paul Blart three. <laughs> Paul Blart three. Mass patrol. Get ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kevin James. I don't know if you heard it anywhere. <laughs> yeah, I've actually seen um, some fans not have masks on when they've been on TV, but it, it's crazy. If you're, as long as you're eating or drinking, you yeah. don't have to have yeah. a mask on. But like, how far does that go, right? Yeah, like, like when the, film, the Eagles fans hours, are beating Eagles fans are beating the, the crap out of each other. Exactly. Bro, I need a mask for that. That's probably a good idea. Drinking the same drink for three hours so you don't have to put your mask on. It's like, wild. It's like, wild. Are they, really, are they really enforcing the rules? I have, a, I have a question. So after the draft passes, how did you decide on going to Minnesota? Um, just sitting down. Uh, the funny, funny story, we just played Memphis, right? Uh, Ryan Silverfield was a coach at UCF, and he happened to be going to the Minnesota Vikings to be the um, quality control coach. So um, the D-line coach calls me and was like, yeah, Ryan Silverfield showed me your film. I don't, <laughs> and it's, it's, I hope he doesn't take this the wrong way. He was like, I don't know what took him so long to show it to me, man, because, uh, you know, you're a hell of a player. And I'm like, damn, I might have could have got drafted by this. <laughs> but now everything happens for a reason. I'm going to Minnesota, getting coached by one of the best D-line coaches, Carl, Carl Dunbar, who's actually the coach for the Pittsburgh Steelers right now. D-line. Oh, cool. They got a pretty good D-line. So You see how that D-line's humming. So there's – there's a reason for that. And, um, you know, I was able to, you know, like I said, find a niche. And, and I actually was able to play with him for two more years uh, when he came to the Jets with Rex Ryan, which, you know, who I really associate myself with the New York Jets because I was yeah. there the longest part of my career. Oh, cool. And so when you go from Minnesota to New York, was was it diff- like in a different atmosphere? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's New York City, right? I mean, I mean, just like with the, with the expectations, even like with, with with the team and that kind of thing, just like kind of because Minnesota's never won before. Yeah, they, they I mean, when they had a good team that year and they actually went to the playoffs. That's um, true. This is the year. This is before Brett Favre got there. This was um, when they um, they uh, I think I believe they might actually won a, might have won the division that year too, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, uh, this is my my rookie maybe. year. And we played, we actually, the funny thing is we played them week 17, right? We were already solidified the number one seed. And uh, all my old teammates were like, hey, dudes, man, y'all don't come with that bullshit. We just need to win this game so we can get in. And I was like, I'm not trying to hear that. You know, especially coming from there, they, you know, they let you walk out the door, you pissed off. I'm like, I'm not trying to hear that. Like, <laughs> but, uh, we we actually started, you know, didn't start a lot of the, the starters. I, I believe Eli didn't even play that game. Um, the uh, Plexico thing had just happened like three weeks before that, uh, the instance with, with the incident with the gun. What was your reaction when you first heard that? 
It was wild, man. Cause uh, he's on know. OnlyFans now. Yeah, uh huh? He's on OnlyFans. You're lying. I swear to God, look it up right. I, I, I promise you. You type in Plaxico OnlyFans, the link will show up. I, I can't. I can't make that what up. What's he doing on there? I don't want to know. I don't want to know. <laughs> the funny thing is, people always associate that with like somebody being, you know, a little, you know, risque. But uh, I've actually. I don't say no people, but I've actually seen people that are really pubbing, like yeah, they're you know, people cleaning up. And making money because they're pubbing their business on there because yeah. people automatically think that's what you're doing, and then once oh, you go there, you're like, oh, this is a cool concept. Da, da, da. I mean, I don't know if I want to be associated with that. I ain't got nothing against OnlyFans, so don't come after me. But um, you know, a, a lot of people that go on OnlyFans before I would say COVID hit was is because we know of what, what they're doing. We know, we know what they're we doing. We know exactly what they were doing, yeah. right? Yeah, so it's, I, it's, it's, it was. It was it was surreal when it, you know, that we come to that team meeting room the day after that. And, um, you know, Plexus was a good dude, great teammate. Uh, I, I mean, I still keep in contact with oh, him. Cool. And it was just, you know, it was just a misfortunate, misfortunate accident that happened to him. Uh, um, but I think it kind of really derailed, you know, who we were. Cause I mean, I, I felt like nobody could stop us at the time. And I was, I was so happy because for one, I was like, they just won the Super Bowl before I got there. So we have a chance to win again. We're number one seed. Two, the Super Bowl's in Tampa, where I'm from, hometown. I'm looking at it like, I'm going to be the man. You know what I'm saying? I'm going back <laughs> home, eight appearances, because this is my hometown. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be love. Man, we end up getting losing to, to Philadelphia in the division round. And then it's crazy because we beat them. That means Arizona has to come play us in the cold, which, you know, they've been out there in Arizona. They, they wasn't going to be built for that. And we would have made a run, I felt like. So, because we had to buy. We had the first round buy because we were the number one seed. And, I was like, man, I could put, you know, potentially get a Super Bowl ring my rookie yeah. year. Like, yeah. that's crazy. That's wild. And then, so that's I have a question. How, how did you react? How, how did you end up with the Rams? Okay, Steve Spagnola was the defensive coordinator when I was with the Giants, right? And he left the next year and got a head coaching job with the Rams. So I made the team with the Giants my second year coming out the gate. And this was like, if there was like a David and Goliath story, this was it, right? So our D-line was already stacked. You know, uh, my rookie year, O.C. didn't play because he had the ACL in camp. So we had O.C. coming back. Then we had Tuck coming back. And Tuck was coming off a Pro Bowl year. Then Matthias Kiwanuku, who they moved from Sam to defensive end, who was a first-round pick. So, and then we still had Barry Cofield, to me, who was one of the best nose tackles in the league. He was on Washington. I remember him on Washington. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Fred Robbins were like our starters before that next year. So going into my second year, uh, Jerry Reese decides to add Chris Canty and Rocky Bernard, who are two both almost Pro Bowl type like players, right? So everybody's looking around like, hmm, <laughs> yo, this D line's out of control. And and uh, you know Jerry Reese wasn't the GM uh, for most of those other guys. So like Barry and, and Fred and Justin. And OC, they were all from the previous regime, GM. So you know how GM is. He wants to, even though we had success going to the Super Bowl and winning. Doesn't matter to them. No, I want this to be my team. It's kind of like if you, if you saw the um, the Bulls' um, last dance, right? Oh, yeah. How that GM it feels like, like it was six years ago that came out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was just like, he was like, even though they had all the success with Michael and them, you know, you know, and he and he helped get that team. He wanted it to be about him. He didn't want it to be about Phil. He didn't want it to be about Mike. So he decided to try to ride with Tony Kukoc, right? Um, so it was similar to that. So we brought all those guys in, and um, and I made the team, which was crazy. I, you know, I was the last D lineman on the roster, but I made it. So the D line consisted of it was Chris Canty, Rocky Bernard, uh, Barry Cofield, Fred Robbins, Matthias Ku- Kiwanuka. Justin Tuck, O.C. Human Yura, Dave Tollison, and then Lige Doosable. <laughs> Literally, it was like that. And I was like, well, I, one reason I think I made the team is because I literally had probably the best preseason I had anybody on that team, not just oh. the line, uh, that year. And they didn't want me to, 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 you know, to be on waivers because they knew there's no way that they were going to be able to keep me. Um, so week one, you know, we're, like I got to say, we're stacked on defensive line. Um, I'm inactive. I don't play because we're so stacked on defensive line. <laughs> um, so week two comes around, like we get three, three, run, not two, three running backs get banged up. Wow. So they come to me and they're like, yeah, we might have to put you on practice squad for a week. And I'm like, what? Like, I didn't literally just got my place 
you know, in Jersey thinking I'm about to be here, you know, all year long. And it's crazy. So they try to put me on the practice squad. And then, you know, I called my agent. I'm like, yo, this is crazy. They're trying to put me on the practice squad, you know. And then Michael Bowley was coming off suspension. Our linebacker they had just paid. So they paid him. They brought him in in the offseason, too. Um, so they were like, we need a spot because we got to, you know, bring in a running back. And Michael Bowley's coming off suspension. Um, so my, my D line coach was like, man, you should be good because Fred, I think Fred Robinson got kind of banged up that game. At the time, I was playing end and tackle, so I was okay. like a utility guy. I could play both. Um, so he was like, man, I don't know how bad Fred is, so we actually probably might need you to play this week. So I'm like, all right, he's giving me, making me a little, feel a little easy, you know, a little bit better about the situation. Yeah. Um, but they called me in, sure enough, and were like, yeah, we're going we're gonna to put you on waivers, and then we're going to bring you back on practice squad. And I'm like, man, this is wild. So we, uh, they had, the Rams actually reached out to us, and Spagnuolo was like, you know, you know, I, I saw what you did last year. I see what you did this preseason. You know, I, I think about you. I'm like, you know, you can play. So I ended up going to the Rams because I didn't want to be, even though, you know, I felt like New York was such a great situation. I loved the city at the time. And the D-line group was amazing. Yeah. I didn't want to be, I felt like going to my second, I had to get film. I had to get game film. Because I didn't really play my rookie year. I was inactive every game because we were so deep. And I was like, I have to actually get some game film. Or I ain't going to be able to be in this league for that long. Like, so I decided to go to the Rams because I knew I was going to play. Uh, we sucked, but, you know, I played, got my game experience, and then um, I, I can't tell you what happened, why I ended up leaving the Rams and going to Jacksonville. Like, that was one of the craziest things I ever saw. But it all worked out well because, like, my NFL career really took off by my third year, and, you know, the rest is history. Uh, I never got cut again after that. Um, I had been cut once actually i take that back i got cut my 10th year <laughs> so from doesn't here count. doesn't from count from here three to ten i had never been cut okay yeah, um cool. yeah which is you know some people don't even play that long uh seven years in between yeah. um but my, but my first year it was bad like from from minnesota to the giants to the rams and then to, to jacksonville and i remember everybody like yeah he's been on four teams in in two years and da-da. but i'm like people don't realize that's most of the NFL is actually like like it's not it's rare for you to stay on one team for your whole career like that never really happens especially today with you know what our people can like almost force their way to being traded out like back in the day owners owners were like I don't care you got a contract you stay here we not trading you but nowadays they're more susceptible to, to, to trading guys cutting guys and getting rid of guys so it's, it's a lot different so everybody's like yeah you know you played on I think was it nine teams in 10 years? But I'm like, yeah, like five of those was in my first two years. Like, hey, y'all need to stop, all right? Yeah. <laughs> I literally no. played for like three teams. Let's yeah. just be honest. <laughs> I, I remember it was a couple of years ago. I, I, I want to say in, in NBA, was it Luke Ribnauer who got traded like four times in three days? Was it oh, something days? like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope, he's, I hope he waited a week before he went anywhere because like, <laughs> I'm done with that. That's it's that's crazy. crazy. Yeah, but like that's literally how most of the NFL is, especially if yeah. you're like a, a late round draft pick or not even that, like say you're a fourth round pick and it just doesn't work out with the team you're with. It's like you starting from square one, like you're under at the free agent. So like, that's literally how most of the league works. Yeah. And then I have a, I have a question. Um, so how, how did you end up with the Jets? So my two years in Jacksonville, you know, I was a, a, a partial starter, especially my fourth year, I became a full-time starter. Oh, cool. And um, uh, they always have this thing and the fans don't really know about that is, it's called a prove a year, right? So, like, as an undrafted guy, they never want to give undrafted guys money unless they've shown consistent for like two to three years. Like, a yeah, yeah. uh, uh, high draft pick could just have one good year and they give him all the money in the world. But that's why he went first round. We saw them BS. Talking okay? about you, Trubisky. Bullshit. See ya. I don't know where you're playing <laughs> next year. Bullshit. <laughs> for some reason, they always treat an undrafted guy like an undrafted guy, no matter how many years. Like the Victor Cruz, like even if he used to be a Victor Cruz, like towards the end of his career, like he made his money with New York, but by the time he got to like Chicago, they were still treating him like he was an undrafted guy. And yes, he had a few injuries, but this guy had been to a couple Pro Bowls. Like it's crazy. Like the only guy that that there's been a few guys, you know, like Brian Young, it's an undrafted guy. Um, I think. Um, For San Fran. Yeah, or was he not? No, no, it was he. Maybe, yeah. maybe not him. Um, who was a D tackle in Minnesota that's in the Hall of Randall? Randall was oh, John Randall. Randall, yeah. Yeah, so he was one of the few guys, like, after he made it, made it. They Warner, Kurt Warner. Kurt Warner, yeah. yeah. That's a quarterback, though. Like, 
as a quarterback, you can be decent and get paid. So yeah, it, like, yeah. The whole different- Hopefully Washington is scouting everywhere because I don't know what the <laughs> hell is going on. So like to me, like Damon Stacks Harrison is a guy I'm really proud of. Like I had him his second year when I was with the Jets and I was going into my sixth year. He was he was he wasn't drafted? No, undrafted. That's, yeah, that's man. Okay. Exactly. So he actually was treated with some respect. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And he got he got that, you know, that second deal. And it was after he got that second deal, he was able to get an extension with Detroit. But then, you know, he went on and, and yeah. he's on Seattle now, right? Ways. Now, now he's in Seattle and he's with a good, you know, a winning team. So uh, I think they're just waiting for him to make sure he's up to speed and everything. And I wouldn't be surprised since they're coming out the bye to see him, you know, suit up this week. Yeah. Uh, they put him on the practice squad, I believe, to get him in shape for like two or three weeks. And yeah. And uh, he's been there for about two weeks now. So yeah. I wouldn't be surprised that they call him up this week. Yeah. You know, and I think some other teams have inquired about him. He said, no, nah, I'm good. So Exactly. So, and, and, and that that gave me so much joy, right, for you to be able to be a free agent and be like, nah, I'm good. You know, yeah. I'll, you know I'll wait and see, you know. And I, I, I literally talked to him, like, almost every day, every other day. And it was just good for him to be able to – to be like, you know, I'll make a decision when I'm ready, you know, to have that power, right? Because a lot of times they they don't they never want players to have that type of player. Yeah, that power. Power, power. But when you play at a high level is that he's played at and you can you know re, you know demand that respect, the teams will, are willing to wait for you because you're that good. And, and that just gave me joy because you know it's hard for free agents to, to climb that ladder yeah. to be able to be in that position. So uh it's it's just amazing to see stories like him yeah. that really pan out. Yeah, so so with the Jets, I'm not asking about this year's Jets. Since you play for the Jets and Giants, who's going to finish with a better record? Really? <laughs> That's like dumpster juice over fire sale. Uh, <laughs> honestly, I would have to say the Giants, just because the the, the the NFC East is so bad, and they could potentially maybe. Get I think the three. And eight, I think three and eighteen outside of Dallas. Three and fifth. Three fifteen and one outside of Dallas. At this yeah, point. exactly. So, like, honestly, like, I could see them maybe upsetting Philly one time, Dallas one time, and, and Washington one time. But I like, honestly, I don't see the Jets beating anybody in the AFC East, right? Do you think that we, we got out of that? They have the NFC West and the yeah. AFC West to contend with. Yeah, like nah. that's the two hardest divisions in football. Like, yeah. who are they beating out of that? Out of those teams? No, nobody. <laughs> COVID. That's it. Um, that's what they're beating. Um, so. With with the with the Jets, do you think they'll win a game? Because I've been looking at the draft this year. Washington slated to pick second. The Jets are picking first. They don't play each other. But yeah. I need the Jets to win three games. Do you think that's going to happen? <laughs> nah, they're not going to win three. Two? I can see them winning maybe two. Honestly, I believe they have the Bills this week, if I'm not mistaken. The Bills are lost two straight. I think they're going to beat the Bills this week. If you believe me, I right. think they're going to beat the Bills this week. I'm just... I've been telling people from day one, you know, I pay for the Bills. I have love for Bill Ma- Bills Mafia. I don't trust Josh Allen. I have never have. Interesting. Um, people were so giddy about him the first four weeks of the season. I'm like, look at who he's playing. I'll give you the Rams game. But to me, the Bills, and not just the Bills, I think Josh Allen's a front runner as far as he can play well with the league. But if you ever see when any adversity hits, it goes downhill for him, right? So in that Rams game, they should have actually lost that game. That was a BS oh, call yeah. on the ref on that P, the DPI. Like I said, a defensive pass interference. And they told refs before the season started that you should only make obvious calls. To me, if you couldn't tell, that was 100% yeah. defensive pass especially on fourth down. One thing that as a player, you never want the game to be taken out of your hands. And that ref took it upon himself to take the game out of his hands. And now Bills Mafia came and attacked me when I said that. And they were like, what about the, the, you know, the interception that wasn't the interception? I was like, granted, that was a bad call, and I'll give you that. That was early in the second quarter, I think, but the end of the second quarter. And a- after they turned the ball over, the Demons still had a chance to, you know, to stop stop the Rams from scoring it and change that momentum. Meanwhile, on that defensive pass interference, they put the ball within the five-yard line with four downs to go. Like you're against the eight ball as a defense right there with, with barely any time left on the clock either. So even if they, the Bills do score there, your offense has no chance, yep. to, you know, to, to put a score up to, to take the lead or tie the game to go into overtime. So I'm like, that's two totally different calls. Like when the game's on the line, you cannot call that as a ref. Like you can't take the game out of the hands of the players. I thought that was bullshit. So it's, honestly, I thought after that Rams game, I was like, I, I'm trying to tell you. And it started with week one versus Jets when he had the two turnovers. 
That was a close wrong. game, wasn't it? Was like, I'm like, if that's not the Jets, they lose that game. If it's anybody else but the New York Jets, the Bills lose. Maybe that game Washington. Washington, Washington, will, Washington would blow the lead too. So. I mean, I, well, I don't know. They won week one. I don't know <laughs> how. I don't know how. They <laughs> had like seven that's sacks. What I'm if it was anybody yeah. else, because the Jets can't even score. That's what I'm saying. At least Washington can put up at least 17 points. So I'm like, if that was anybody else but the Jets, the Bills lose week one, honestly. So I'm like, so y'all, everybody's on the, the bandwagon. They're like, well, he played the two best teams. They really played the Titans. And then he played the Bills. He played the Titans with the Titans having no practice for like 10 days. You're telling me you played the Titans that, who had no practice for at least 10 days, and they came out there and They had drunk. one at that middle school. They had that one middle school practice. They got in trouble for it. That's it. We got in trouble for it. <laughs> And, and and they didn't just lose. They got drummed by the Titans. They got whooped. Like, it wasn't like the game was close. So I'm like, we'll see. Like, I'm calling it right now. Don't be surprised. Make sure you, you tweet me out when I say I got you. I got you. <laughs> the Jets are going to upset the Bills this week. I'm calling it right now. Who do you think on the team is a foundational piece besides Makai Becton? Okay. And that's – it's funny that you asked me that, right? So I did an interview with ESPN Radio. Was it last night or Monday night with Larry Hart, uh, Hardesty? Okay. And he asked me to talk about the New York Jets. And I think to me, the biggest issue is they don't, you know, they don't have an identity, right? Or a coach. Um, <laughs> you can say that or, or, or whatever. Offensive, what do they call him? An offensive Honestly, guru? Adam, offensive Adam guru. 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 Okay. Yeah. I don't believe he's the right guy. I don't know where that came from him being an offensive guru. They got but, him. He got it's, them. It's, I'll tell you that. Besides, like you said, besides Makai Bacon, like who do they hang their hat on? And it's like, I feel bad for Sam Donald because another person that's had multiple, you know, offensive coordinators since he's been there. Like, like, can you really put the blame on the kid? Now, one thing he does need to do is stop turning the ball over in red zone. Yeah. Like, and I've been saying that since his rookie year, and people actually looked at me crazy when I compared him to Ryan Fitzpatrick. And I got love for Fitz. I don't hate that. One, I don't hate it. One of, one of my best teammates I've ever had. I'd go to war with that guy any day. But he's a gunslinger, and he always has been. You live by him, you die by him. And I feel like Sam Donald has some of that in him. And he had it at, at USC. And I said, to me, this kid, honestly, you can say all you want about him, his competitiveness and him, you know, his arm talent. Um, some people say he has arm talent. Some people say he doesn't. But his accuracy, one thing that really irks me is that he turns the ball over. And I, maybe that's just a defender in me because of the defense, you know, uh, you know, playing with Rex. We always had a good defense. We just needed the offense not to lose the game for us, right? And you can't turn the ball over in the red zone because you're already giving up three points automatically or, or field goal to attempt. If you turn the ball over, that's like a 10 point swing if they yeah. go down and score. Yeah. So like, that's the thing that has always irked me with Sam is, is, is he's definitely has shown that he can be a good player and he'll have some wild plays, right? Yeah. He'll, have some wild throws. he'll have some wild throws. I mean, even that run on, uh, I believe it was that Thursday night yeah. game, if anybody saw that in his arsenal. But they'll have he'll have plays where he'll just throw the ball to the other team and it, and it irks you. And something as a quarterback in this league, there's something you really can't do. You can't turn the ball no. over. No. And he's reckless with the ball at times. And so has Josh Allen. So that's why I don't I don't trust him. And until he proves me wrong, I'm gonna stick to saying that. Now with Darnold, I had an idea for a great Halloween costume last year, but I thought of it too late. Remember remember the Monday night game? Was that, no, when he had so he saw ghosts. Oh, wow. I was going to go with Sammy Phantom. <laughs> That's kind of funny, man. Yeah, but it, I, I thought of it like on November 12th. It didn't, it didn't work. Yeah, it was a little late. Um, now, I, I've seen flashes in him. Like, he, he shows yeah. flashes of greatness. He shows, like, I remember, I'm pretty sure the first game, his first throw was a pick six, and they won that game. So he yeah. shows he's got the confidence to come back and do that. Some of these other quarterbacks. Uh, and that's Daniel, one thing I, I do admire about him, yeah. right? He's never too high, never too low. Yeah. The game never gets too big. I mean, I think the only game that got big for him was that game versus New England where he saw the ghost. But other than that game, through through his first three years of his career, yeah. like he has short-term memory. Yeah, he's going to come back. But that's but that's why I compared him to Ryan Fitzpatrick. That's, that's, how, that's exactly how Fitzy plays. Like, he's never going to be down. You're going to get the same energy from that guy no matter what. He's going to play with excitement. Sam doesn't have as much excitement as Ryan Fitzpatrick has, but he's going to be even kilt and he never gets too high or too low. And he's going to go out there and compete. I mean, he's been given a bad rap and yeah. he's been put in a lot of bad situations. So I don't know how you accurately evaluate this kid because name some of his weapons besides Crowder. Like who is somebody he's throwing the ball to? Jesus. Literally. They got that one kid, yeah, the, the one kid from Gilman. Gilman. <laughs> they got that. Yeah. 
Oh my you know, god! But, you know, oh yeah, they got hurt. they got the Perryman. Yeah, but he's been hurt, like, and and that's been his issue, uh, one of his issues for his career, like him staying healthy. They, yeah, they, like, every week they say, "Oh, watch out for Herndon," and I go, "Where?" So and that I, that kid, if anybody hurts me, it's him. I feel like that kid had so much ability; he should have been an All Pro tight end. But you know, he's had the injury issue, yeah. and he can't stay healthy, and then he has problems with drops. And I don't understand it because this kid is, is literally costing himself a lot of money. Yeah. He's yeah. made a lot of money. But before the season, I was talking to somebody. I said, who, I forget who it was. And I said, who are your four breakout tight ends this year? And they said, Johnny Smith, Noah Fant, TJ Hawkinson, and Chris Herndon. I'm like. That actually that. My, my, my four too, honestly, because yeah. I, I felt like Johnny Smith He's a beast. was going to take off, especially with um, Walker finally leaving. I felt like it was going to be, and it has been a big year for him so far. Yeah. I mean, Hawkinson, I, I could see it happening too, because you saw, you know, glimpses of it last H- year. Hawkinson needs then, to get back to me on LinkedIn. He read my yeah. message and didn't respond. TJ, I'm talking to talk, Hawkinson. <laughs> Fant, I already knew it, what it was going to be. A phantom machine, him. yeah. We, we knew what it was going to be with him. But Herndon was my guy. I was like, Herndon's going to have a breakout year this year because everybody has been waiting for this kid for the last two or three years to stay healthy and really ball out. And this is finally going to be the year he does it. And he hasn't been healthy, and he hasn't balled out. <laughs> Who's that kid they drafted, the receiver? I haven't heard his name once. Um, oh, Mims, because he hasn't played. That's, that's another thing. I'm like, so how can you honestly evaluate Sam? Because literally each week he's playing, and I have nothing against practice squad, but I started on the practice squad. But he's playing with guys that are, have been on practice squad, and, 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 and I haven't really been in game-like situations like that. Now, as the season go on, those players will get better and better. But it's like – when you're throwing to so many different receivers, it's hard to really build continuity. And I think that like it's almost comparable to like the Carson Wentz thing, right? Yeah. He had to deal do so much with so little there. Yeah. And you know, he gets a bad rap because of the interceptions, but you gotta think he's down 21 nothing every game. He has to like like throw hooks and jabs and everything to try to fight to get his way back in. And every game he has shown that he can bring his team back and fight and, and tooth and nail. You saw versus the Ravens, they were down big. Only lost that game at the end on a two-point conversion that fell. Like, they were still in the game. And same thing with Pittsburgh. I think they were down by 21 and came back, had a chance to win that game. So, like, he's shown – I mean, he has to turn, stop with the turnovers too. But, I mean, you have to take chances when you're down big in games. Whatever happened to Mims, the, the rapper? I have no idea. What, he had one song that was a hit. Yeah, yeah. What What was the song? I don't know. I'm on Wikipedia right now. I'm going to type in the past 30 seconds. He I, had one song – he, he got BET Hip Hop Awards Rookie of the Year, but for what? Um, <laughs> they don't even put that. Wikipedia is failing me right now. No, but I wondered. Yeah, that was, that, as soon as I saw Mims, I'm like, damn, I haven't thought about Mims in about twelve years. Um, yeah. No, that's that's what. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, they've got some Barrios. I don't know what the hell you're getting from Braxton Barrios. Yeah, I mean, I feel like what what hurt Barrios is when Crowder came back. Barrios yeah. was playing some of the best yeah. career. It's because he's the slot guy, right? But you got Crowder, who's one of the best slot guys in the league. You're not gonna put Barrios in front of him and 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 you know Crowder does most of his work in the slot. You don't yeah. want to put him on the outside, but Barrios has struggled on the outside. It's because they're almost, you know, I won't say the same player, but they're very similar. Yeah. And when when Crowder it's no, it's no um, you know, oh, no this is why player. I'm hot. This is why I'm hot. That's yeah, I, was gonna say, I was about to say this is why I'm hot, right? But I didn't know if that was right. If Denzel uh, doesn't have that on his iPhone, he's doing something wrong. <laughs> I play that every no. day. Now yeah. It's no wonder why Barrios has struggled the last couple of weeks because Crowder is back. Yeah. Do, do you th- I'm trying what about what's the Quentin Williams? What do you think of him? I really thought he was gonna take a jump, you know, in his second year. And he showed spurts, you know, in a few games this year, but I really thought he could, you know, really grow and dominate this year. But you know, with with the D line being what it is, you know, we just lost one of our veteran, you know, players in Stephen McClendon to trade. I heard he drove from Tampa to Miami. You mean Miami to Tampa, yeah. Miami to Tampa. Exactly. He didn't even get back on the plane. He drove straight from there. With, he with, goes, I'll, I'll, I'll see y'all. I'm out. I'm gone. I mean, yeah. He's going back to a system where he's comfortable in with Todd yeah. Bowles, who brought him in to, to New York. And uh, he's more comfortable in that system. And, you know, they lost Vita Vea, so they needed somebody to plug in next to Sue in that position. And I think he'll he'll do well for Tampa Bay, and he gets to go to a winning team. But getting back to Quentin Williams, it's just like you can't be the only guy, right? I mean – uh, a lot of those other players haven't showed up. And that was a lot of thing, a lot that the fans were, fan base was talking about. Like we haven't had a pass rusher, you know, we haven't had a defensive end get 10 plus sacks since 
2013 when, when Calvin Pace did it. Damn. And then Mo, Mo Wilkinson did it, but, you know, he's an inside-out guy, and he did it in 2015. But those are the last two guys that have had 10-plus sacks. And I don't even think we've had anybody had over eight sacks since then either. So it's like they got rid of uh, Leonard Williams yep. to the Crosstown team. They traded him over there. So it's like, uh, yeah, you can kind of give get after Quentin Williams a little bit, but it's like – what other help does he have? You know, Jordan Jenkins is, is a good pro. Yeah. He's not a guy that's going to get you eight or nine sacks, though, every year. Um, he's more of a run defensive end that plays really hard. And and, and then Henry Anderson, you know, when he when he got his – He's still he, in the league? Hey, yeah, he's still there when he got paid. Damn, when, I remember when he was he, on the Colts. When it, It's like he disappeared when he got paid. <laughs> the, year, the year he was going in the contract year, and when he got traded from the Colts because they changed up the scheme. He played, he played a fuck. I think he played amazing. I believe he had almost eight sacks. Wow. And he got paid. And then we haven't really heard from him since then. Do you think they so after this year, do you think if they get the number one pick, they should take Trevor Lawrence? Or you think they should give Darnold another try? I just think it's hard for any team that has the number one pick not to pass up on Trevor Lawrence. I mean, um, it says like uh, if you gotta keep you gotta keep sometimes you gotta just keep drafting quarterbacks until you got the right one. You look at Arizona, yeah. you know. I actually thought Josh Rosen was going to be probably the best quarterback out of that class, but he's been given a bad rap too. Like he didn't really have a chance in Arizona. And then the next year, new coaching staff comes in and they decide that they're going to go with Kyler Murray yep. after literally the year before they just drafted him. Right. Yep. So he's been bounced around a few bit and now he's in Tampa on practice squad, which, which is probably one of the best things for him. He could maybe be an heir apparent to Tom Brady down the road. You know, who knows how long Tom Brady's going to be there. But he's never really had like a, a veteran presence to learn from because when he was in Arizona, he had to sit through, you know, being with Kyler. They didn't really have a veteran quarterback there. He had to sit with Kyler. And then they then he got traded to Miami. And yes, they had Fitz there, but it's, it was like he didn't know if he was going to be the starter or not. And it was up in the air week in and week out. So, I mean, it, it was, he's just been through a lot. And that's, I think it's been a lot of disservice done to a lot of these young quarterbacks. Dwayne Haskins being another one. Yeah, all right, that's that's the one I was going to ask you about. Player, but no, a lot of times it falls on the coach. Like, you, you have to be in the right system or you're going to fall by the wayside. Do you think the Washington football team has failed Haskins, or what do you, what do you think of that? A hundred percent. I mean, if you look at his act, like, the coach said he didn't even want him. Like, he, he was wasn't even the real there. coach. He was like, Gruden was but gone. It doesn't matter when your head coach comes out and says that, like, Right then and there, you like you failed the player right then and there. Whether you like just the same thing in, in New York with Le'Veon Bell, after the kid, after the, he gets signed, like whether you want him or not, he's on your team. Like yep. find a way to use him, be productive, do your job as a coach, and put him in the best uh, position where he can actually make plays for you. He's one of the best running backs out of the out of the backfield. How you don't line him up outside or give him at least four or five passes a game is is baffling to me. And with the Dwayne Haskins thing, like. Whether you wanted him or not, supposedly Bill O'Brien didn't want Deshaun Watson. Well, Bill O'Brien's gone, and Deshaun Watson's one of the best quarterbacks in the in the league for a reason, right? Yeah. So, like, uh, you would have to say that Bill O'Brien probably had to swallow his pride and decided to, you know, coach Deshaun up, whether he wanted him or not, and it panned out right for them, right? They, they, I think they were back to back AFC South champions, yeah. and you know they haven't gone far in the playoffs, but they were they were a second half away from you know beating Kansas City yeah. last year. And um, I think it's, you know, these coaches have done these players a disservice. Like, whether you agree with the GM or not, yeah. the job is the coach the team that's on the field. You need to coach them to the best of your ability. I got a question for Bell. When, when he dropped that mixtape that one night at, at midnight, did you did you listen to that and go, oh, he's going to the Jets? Well, I knew he was. You know, I was an insider then. That was my oh, first you knew? podcast. Yeah, I knew he was coming to the Oh, Jets. all right. I was listening uh, to that. I'm like, I, I don't been, hear anything. Yeah, yeah. I had, been, I, had been, I had been talking to him, and I had been kind of pubbing for him to go there. And, Maybe I feel a little bit bad because all the stuff he had to do. He's deal doing with. all right now. He's in KC. I'm, I think he's, he's in Kansas right. City now. He's a, he's a lot richer, you know, and playing. He's playing for what a million dollars, maybe two, depending on if he has the get a ring. But yeah, he can get a ring, and also you know, just for paying most of his salary this year, so yeah. he's not tripping about that. But when he came in, I thought that would be the best pickup for the New York Jets because they were everybody was so worried about the pressure on Sam Donald. But what? What better security blanket it is on third and short and third and five to just dump it off to the running back and have him make a play in the open field. But, you know, with Gates, they just never really, you know, used them in the right way. They never ran them the right way, and the scheme didn't fit for him. But I think in Kansas City, that's a perfect scheme for him. He'll be able to – I don't know if you saw the game versus, versus the Bills this last weekend. That offensive line, and it was nothing but backups on the Kansas City offensive line. They mauled the Bills defensive line, literally. Maud him. I think they had 46 carries 
anytime you have that many carries in a game, most likely you're going to win the game because you're controlling the clock and running the ball down people's throats because you're not going to run the ball that many times unless it's, you're effective with it. And they were highly effective with it. So I, that, that they were kind of reminded me of, you know, when he was in his Pittsburgh days when they were just staying on double teams and, and Clyde Edward, Edward Jalera was just finding holes. And I think he, he felt a little pressure, you know, by Levy Mon coming because that was the best game of the year for him so far. So I want to get back on Haskins. This, this is my evaluation of somebody who's never played football, just watching. He looks he looks a little bit off kilter when a rush is coming. They, they don't have anything to work with. There's the offensive line is a Patrick. Trent Williams is in uh, Saint, uh, San Francisco outside of Terry McLaurin. They just signed Robert Foster. I'm very excited about. I don't think the Bills ever gave him a chance. He can ball. Yeah. I, 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 I've seen flashes similar to Darnold. But do you think he should have been more vocal saying I need help in the offseason? I mean, can you really come out and say that? Because you're I, I mean, Don Inman is the best receiver they brought on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but you gotta but you gotta look at it like he's a rookie quarterback. You're I not, know. You're supposed to be, you know, seen, not heard. And and he had kind of a rocky start to his rookie career. Like you can't really yeah, you because know, they would have painted him like Baker. You know how Baker got all that flack, you know, for, for his damn commercials were on. It's driving me it's nuts. Crazy. Talking weight, and you see how much flack he's getting for all this yeah. right now, right? And it's and it's crazy to think that they're four and two, right? So imagine if they were like like Washington one and whatever they are, right? One and five. Season's one. over. I'm ready for the draft. Yeah, um, exactly. Like they would. And I mean, they benched them this last game, so we'll see going yeah. forward. I mean, I, I think it's hard for, for to say that they, that they wouldn't start Baker this upcoming week. I, I think it's almost impossible to say yeah. that, especially being four and two and and still in the playoff hunt. Like, yeah, they have one. Of, they're in the, one of the hardest divisions in football, besides Cincinnati, who you know they have a you know a great outlook with Joe Burrow. Yeah. But besides that. You know, that's, you know, I hate to say any team's a win, but, you know, Cincinnati looks like a win for, for, for oh, yeah. Them. And they got them again this week. So, okay. Yeah, I mean, if, it's, if there's any team that you make everybody feel better again, it's, yeah. it's New York Jets and Cincinnati Bengals. So, yeah. so those are, those are two teams, you know, that when you have them on the schedule, and like I said, you have to come to, to, to play every Sunday. Yeah. There's a, there's a game you're like, yo, we can win that game and we can get this feeling back. And yeah. I think it's a get right game for the, for both, uh, for the Browns. Because you know they, they really got smacked up by Pittsburgh. Like the two, the two other division teams that they're chasing in this division in Baltimore and Pittsburgh, they, they got smacked up pretty bad versus those two teams. Yeah, if, honestly, if I was Ron Rivera, I would have given Hastings until Week Six because you're going you're going one and five against an Owen. What would it have been one and four against an Owen five Giants team? Yeah, Jones doesn't really. Jones has a little bit more options to work with on offense. But that's that's where I want to see him compete for him yeah, to not even be that, active. That's what kind of irked me too, and I understand Ron. You know, doing it wasn't his guy. He didn't bring him on. Yeah. But it's yeah. like it's kind of like what we talked about it, right? Like you inherited that team. You inherited yeah. the first round pick. Yeah. Don't do a disservice by benching this kid that early. Like he hasn't had close to a full season either season. Like he didn't play till late last year, yeah. and he only gave him what four games this year. And yeah. then, like, he won the first game. I mean, your defense played out of its mind. Yeah. I'll give you that. But he still he still didn't lose it for him. You know what I'm saying? And then Kyle Allen, you know, didn't do much better versus the Giants. Now, the Giants defense has been a lot better than it was yeah. last year. But for, I think they only they didn't even score, what, 17 points or something like that? Like, I think it was 20, I want to say 2019. 2019. Like, so you didn't even put 20, up 21 and you lost the game. So you're telling me Dwayne Haskins couldn't have played that game? Like, well, one of, one of the reports out of the locker room after they benched Haskins was that he was against the Baltimore game that he, I think he finished with like 300 yards or something. And even though they lost to Baltimore, there were reports saying that he was kind of like giddy about his stat line in the locker room. Would that have pissed you you off as a guy like, we just lost this game, like, chill? Hell yeah. That's why I said, that's why he couldn't have said nothing because like when you're a rookie or a young player, your job is to be seen, not heard. Yeah, like, yeah. What the hell are you giddy about that you threw for 300 yards? We just got our ass whooped. Yeah. Literally, they got whooped that game. Like, so it's ridiculous. Yeah. And then, so I want, I want to, before I forget, I want to ask you about your podcast. So, can you tell me a little bit, like, why, why you decided to get into it and a little bit of what, what you're doing? So, yeah, I have multiple podcasts. I'll get into the one that, that I'm currently doing right now. I mean, I'm currently doing them all, but the, the UCF podcast is called Two Nights, One Podcast. It's, it's me and my other host, Scott Adams. We sit down and it's all about UCF football, right? Cool. So we, um, each week we have an opponent and we go over um, 
keys to success and, and, and things that – and then we, we – pre not preview, but we go over the previous games and, and we talk about why the Knights won or why they lost and some of the things that they could do a little bit better. And then I always try to get a guess from the opponent's team that went to that school. So uh, this week we have Tulane and earlier – we shot the podcast episode and we had Orleans Darkwar on there. Oh, he you went know, there? No, he, he went, went there. Yeah, he went to Tulane. Uh, we played ECU earlier in the year. I had Chris Johnson. Hey. We Georgia Tech. Uh, uh, had, we played Georgia Tech the first week. I had Derek Morgan on. And we always tried I've been to get trying to get him forever. I reached out. He's doing like some financial thing now. I, I reached yeah. out. I, 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 dude, he's a legend. He's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we talked about that, what he's doing all the field. And we also talked about Georgia Tech versus UCF. And it's, it's really fun. And we try to keep it nice and light. Um, we, we accept questions from people. So if you guys oh, want to hit us on Twitter, two, guy, uh, two Nights, One Podcast, you can listen to us also on all, all your podcast uh, you know, channels, uh, Apple, Spotify, iHeart. We're on all of that. So definitely give it a listen. And then I have the Anything is Doosable uh, podcast. And with that podcast, I really wanted to use my platform to shed light on some of the positivity that a lot of the NFL players are doing. Oh, cool. So I've had guests like Deion Dawkins, the tackle from Buffalo yeah. Bills, Carlos Dunlap, the defensive end. I had Super during Super Bowl week. I had Art Eric Armstead. Oh, cool! I also had Steph Gilmore right before he won Defensive Player of the Year, and I knew he was going to win. Yeah. Uh, and I literally just talk about we just talk about football, and we talk about the person who they are outside of football. Because a lot of, of fans don't know who who players are outside of football, so we really discuss who they are outside of football and their likes and dislikes, and then also. If they're into any like charitable things, and you know, Eric Armstead is really big and has always been vocal about all the work he does in his hometown of Sacramento. Um, Steph Gilmore does a lot with the Boys and Girls Club because that's yeah. where he went, you know, growing up. He does a lot of stuff in the Boston area with, with the Boys and Girls Club. And we discussed that because I think yeah, so many times that, you know, they only talk about the negativity that, you know, player NFL players get and, and, and they do. And then like, 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 it's like with anything, right? Not every, not everybody's a bad apple, but uh, you know, that stuff really gets, you know, really highlighted when something bad happens with an NFL player. So I want to use my platform to, to show some of the positivity that a lot of these players are doing and, and highlight that. And then my lot, my last thing, I have a cooking show. It's called Cooking with Chef Dudes. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, or I guess a lot of people do know this if you follow me on social media, I'm an amateur chef. So uh, with with my anything is doable podcast, I usually take my guests. This is pre COVID, of course. Yeah, yeah. I usually take my guests into the kitchen with me and cooking. You know, starting around Super Bowl time, I started you know doing a video instead of having them come in, you know, and sit in my living room and, and have this conversation. We would do it over you know Skype or, or Zoom yeah. or, or or you know um, FaceTime, record it, and then I would you know cook do a cooking show in their honors and, and cook cook something that I think that they would enjoy. So that's what I do. And you can check that out on YouTube and also Instagram TV, Cooking with Chef Dudes. Also, Anything is Dudes Bulls on everything, Apple, iHeart, Spotify, and YouTube. So you can check that out too. Cool, 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 man. And so how can people find you on uh, social media to finally keep up with you and keep up with everything you're doing? Yeah, so uh, it's at Lige, L-E-G-E-R, D is in dog, O-U-Z-A-B-L-E. And that's Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. They're all the same. Cool, 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 man. Well, this has been a blast, man. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat. I'm hoping the Jets win four games. I'm telling yeah. you, I believe, hold on, let's let's look that up. I believe that they have the bill. Right, I'm going to pull up the schedule. I'm pull up the schedule real quick. Let's see. Let's see. Where they're like. So, Bills, you, you like the uh, Jets. You the Jets like- really, well, this is in. This could be breaking news for you. The Jets are really, it's like a fire set. They're trading everybody. They just traded linebacker Jordan Willis who was already uh, brought from Cincinnati uh, earlier last year, was, I believe, a third-round pick defensive end. The Bills just – I mean, the 49ers just traded for him. So it's almost like a fire sale <laughs> for the Jets. They literally are getting rid of everybody. So, our, our, you know, last year we had tanking for two. Is it tanking for, for, for Trevor Lawrence this year? I think – this is – off the top, they're not, they're not beating the Chiefs. Um, so is it the Bills this week? I Bills this week. I, I know you like the Bills versus them, and it's in New York. I like the Jets. I, I could see them up upsetting Miami if two is playing and he's not really getting yeah, it. And Fitz is playing, no way. But if two, maybe. Yeah. If Tua, maybe the Raiders. That's the kind of game everybody's like, oh, the Raiders are going to win and the Raiders let you down. Yeah, right? last year the Jets beat the dog crap out of the Raiders. I called it. Nobody, everybody looked at me crazy. <laughs> they're not beating Seattle. Rams, Browns, we don't know if they're legit yet. Patriots, we don't know what's going to happen. I'm just hoping they win more than Washington. So we'll see what happens. But yeah. So you want, you want Trevor Lawrence. Oh, yeah. Win. I, 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 <laughs> it's just crazy so it's like right say say the top four 
top three picks are I think Lawrence. What, is, what are New York teams in Washington? Do all three of them consider taking Lawrence? Like and I, trading their trading their quarterback? If Daniel Jones can stop turning the damn ball over, I think they might look at the kid from um uh Oregon. Or oh the tackle Sewell. Sewell. Tackle. Sewell. <coughs> I don't think I don't think them or Darnold is out there and the kid from North Dakota State. What do you think of him? Because he's had one year and then he had like one him. game. Mm-hmm. I like him a lot. Uh, I think we'll learn more if he goes to the senior bowl, which I think he should go to because even Carson Wentz went to the senior bowl and yeah. he didn't have to. Uh, I like him, though. Big athletic kid with a strong arm. And you know how it is in the NFL these days. You got to have a, you have to have some mobility about you. And, and this kid has shown. And I've talked to a few scouts that said, you know, if, if, if Trevor Lawrence is one, then at two, Justin Fields and this kid are like neck and neck. Like some teams have the North North Dakota State kid ranked a little higher. Some kids have, you know, Justin Fields ranked a little higher. So uh, who's to say which guy goes before them? Um, a lot of people thought that um, the kid from uh, the kid from the Chargers, uh, Herbert, He's was going to go before. Yeah, and I actually thought he should go before Herbert. I mean, before Tua, but that didn't end up happening. I believe he went what a pick after him. Yeah. Or two picks after him. Yeah, and he's been playing literally like on another level for a rookie. You would he not need, know. He need to court. get some skin cream, and then he'll be good to go. <laughs> yeah, I was talking to somebody yeah. last week, and I said, "Hey, they got all these billboards in LA. You're telling me Akibu can't find one and sign that kid? Give me a break with that." I shit. I guarantee he's working on that deal because it's LA. He's gonna get that deal. No, they're gonna yeah. work on him, and he'll be all right. But you, you take that. I mean, that proves that that's how young he is, right? Yeah. <laughs> who's Who's the best DN in this year's draft? Ah. Uh, I know, I know Wake has a kid. Yeah, Wake has a pretty good kid. Penn State has a pretty good kid. Oh, I, oh yeah, uh, Parsons? Yeah, yeah. Um, hmm, that's a good question, man. Um, there's a lot of good – lot of. I mean, every year there's, there's, there's good D linemen. Um, I'm going to I'm gonna have to do a little bit more research before yeah. I give you a definitive <laughs> answer on who I think is going to be the best DN coming out. Because, like, you know, people always want to rank people so high in the beginning of the year and – you know, that, that can change drastically towards the end of the year.